Hi, this is Gilbert Gottfried, and this is Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast. I'm here with my co-host, Frank Santo Padre, and this is all taking place at the legendary Friars Club in New York City, where if you look at the plaque when you first walk in, it says Jester Gilbert Gottfried. Ah, yes, very good. Our guest this week is an actor, author, voiceover artist, and one of the most successful and popular stand-up comedians in the world. He's appeared in hit TV shows like That 70s Show, Ed, Portlandia, and Bob's Burgers, and starred in two Grammy-nominated comedy specials. He's also authored two best-selling books, Dad is Fat and Food, a Love Story. His new series, The Jim Gaffigan Show, has received glowing reviews and has featured everyone from Chris Rock to Jon Stewart to former Amazing Colossal podcast guests Dave Attell and Steve Buscemi and Jim's co-star, Adam Goldberg, and let's not forget, Gilbert Gottfried. (laughs) Please welcome Fresh from his command performance for the Pope, a man far too important and busy to be caught dead appearing on this show, our pal, Jim Gaffigan. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. This This is an honor, Gilbert. Yes. This is this is cool that we're doing this at the Friars, too, right? Oh, yeah. Now, let's talk about your first special. Okay. Bitches be sucking my dick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm known as a clean comic, but the reality is, is that I have uh, this new line of anal plugs. That, oh, God. And what's unique about them is that they have my face on them. <laughs> This is different than I thought it was going to yeah. be. He was much different. I didn't understand this. I wish they could see how many cards he has laid out. Right now. now, now you, you, I heard, don't like to be called a clean comedian. I, well, you know, do you want, uh, you know, I think uh, comedians want to be known as funny, really. Right? Yeah. So anything else? I think good-looking comedians... Don't want to be known as good looking. I hate right? it. I yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, I just would rather be known as a comedian who happens to be clean because God loves him more. You know, I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just it's an advantage of being the chosen one. <laughs> You know, Dara, Gil- Gilbert's lovely yeah. wife and the co-producer yes. of this show was saying before, before you got here, she said, Jim and Gilbert are polar opposites. I, Jim is Jim works clean. Gilbert works dirty. Jim likes working with his wife. Gilbert does it grudgingly. But don't you feel as though, I mean, you could get the most different comedians, but I think in the end, we're all weirdos. Oh, we're yes. All, there's something very, even if somebody's, like if Carrot Top was here right now, he would feel like a brother, wouldn't he? Oh, yeah. Right? It, so. it is that thing of like the psychoses are right. all the same. And, and so, and everyone looks at the spouses or the partners of comedians with a certain like, oh, wow, you, you're sucking that up, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you're, <laughs> you're trudging through that. You thought it was going to be easier. You, the, uh, these strong women that think they're going to fix us. <laughs> you know what? I use a fixer upper. <laughs> It's like training a tiger. They're not puppies. <laughs> right? And now you actually love doing stand-up. I do love it. Yeah, I love it. I mean, I feel uh, it's... Don't you feel great after a set? Or do you feel... Or are you somebody who never feels good after a set? Well, I my fantasy, right before I'm about to go on stage is that the manager is going to come backstage and go, there was like a fire or a flood. Oh, Here's your check. Go home. Yeah, that's it. I mean, I just feel as though uh, stand-up can cure me of uh, life's uh, afflictions. Like, So if I'm 
tired, doing stand-up can make me – it gives me a boost of energy, and then I can't sleep. But if I'm sad, it can change my mood. If I'm, if I'm uh, overly confident, it kind of balances me out as to what uh, – where I should be. So I feel like stand up, I, you know, like I always think it's strange when people are like, can you believe Seinfeld's doing stand up? I'm like, he doesn't have a choice, everyone. Yeah. It's like once you're a comedian, you have that heroin in your system, right? Well, it's, it's like when the biggest news story in the world was, did, did you see Eddie Murphy was doing stand up? <laughs> yeah. And I thought, it's oh, not that weird. Yeah. It's not like uh, you know a, f- a quarterback playing in the fifties, and then you know what he's going to be playing for the Giants this weekend. It's not that rare. It doesn't. You know, here we are at the Friars. There are nev- ninety-year-old comedians that go up that oh, can yeah. barely move, and then when they get on stage, they kind of light up. Gilbert's one of them. Yes. <laughs> 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 you're not jaded about it. I found it interesting to say, you know, to read that you, you're still grateful. You're still surprised that you're in show business, coming from yeah, where you come well, from. Well, I am. I am grateful. I think that. I mean, you know, Atel and I always, because you know, Atel's complaining all the time. I mean, we're all complaining. Yeah. But uh, I, you know, I do, you know, think that like I don't take for granted that there are a lot of people that have horrible jobs that. Um, that don't get to do what they like. And it's like, you know, not only do we get to do what we like, we also make a living. And so there is something about, uh, you know, stand-up, I think, is the one meritocracy in the entertainment industry. I mean, it's it's horrible because it's in the entertainment industry, but it's like you either can make people laugh or not. And it's not as if, you know, like, look, there's there's it, it evens out every now and then, but it's essentially... You know, people are talented. Dane Cook's talented. You know, uh, Carrot Top, all these people, people might have, you know, like they might be jealous a little bit, but it's not as if comedians that you don't necessarily like their style of comedy, they're either good or bad, and they get the job done, and if they don't get the job done, we kill them. (laughs) And, you know, it's it's funny, because I always complain about where I am in the business, why am I, I hate it. And I, the the thought I always get in my mind is I envision my father sitting across from me, yeah. and saying to my father who ran a hardware store in Coney Island, saying, "Oh God, it's it's awful. They they put me in this hotel room. Yeah, they're paying for it. Yeah, and but I gotta for like about forty five minutes to an hour tell jokes." Yeah. And then get off stage. It's like I got there and there wasn't free water or free yeah, drinks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that, that being said, I think I was very um, – I think I was very frustrated and bitter at the beginning. Like when I started stand-up, I think I was somebody that did stand-up for six weeks and was like, all right, well, when am I going to be on Letterman? Oh, yes. Like, I think I was very – um, uh, for us, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm really great at navigating the entertainment industry. Like, I don't feel like I, uh, like here we are at the Friars, which is like this legendary place where comedians hang out. It's like, I love comedians, but like a group of comedians, I don't know if I'd want to be in a room with like, oh, yeah. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's like the worst ad for the Friars. But it's That's okay. Just, it's like one of those things where, and I have friends and I saw a poster, they're doing a show, and I'm like, I, you know, I have a certain amount of anxiety. When I see uh, more than three comedians, and I love comedians, and but there's, I mean, one on one or or like maybe two or three, that's fine. But like if there's like five or six, that's that's stressful for me. So there's some of uh, you know when I started, I guess the point I was getting to is like when I was starting that whole being deferential to the comedy club manager and. And kind of schmoozing people so that I could maybe open for them. I was horrible at that. And I can kiss ass like nobody. <laughs> I really am. I'm not saying I'm not, you know, like I don't do that. I don't, do, you know, I don't yeah. beg. I will beg. I just don't know how to do it. Like Greg Giraldo got me tons of spots because I would go with him and we would go out to Long Island 
And I wouldn't know how to talk to these guys. To them, I look like John Tesh. You know, so they're like, <laughs> they're like, who is this guy? And Geraldo would be, he's funny. You should let him do a spot. And so, uh, yeah, so like that part of that process. And I sometimes like when I think about like where I am in the entertainment industry and like dealing with agents and going to parties. In the end, I really don't want to go to these parties. Oh, yeah. Like red carpets and stuff like that. It seems like it's really fun. And then you get there and you're like, this is horrible. Why are we pretending we're at a ball where they were just showing, you know, uh, you know, some animated movie an hour ago? It's weird. So. Speaking of the late great Greg Giraldo, is, is yeah. Adam's character a composite of Dave, Dave Attell and, and Greg and Todd Barry and yeah, some of yeah, our other yeah, friends? Yeah, he's, you know what's great is he, he's all those guys, but we realize that now, because we're so lucky that we didn't cast a real comedian, because a real comedian has a real career, and so if we had cast Dave Attell, we would have to... You know, Dave Attell, you know, is a human being who might be like, I don't know if you want to, I want to be this guy, but Adam's such a great actor. And so we're in the process of writing another season and we, he can do anything. Yeah. He can be any kind of monster because if you know Adam Goldberg, he's not a monster. I mean, he, he's crazy, but he's not like, like we can make him the most lecherous guy in the world. But if it was Dave Attell, we wouldn't be able to do that. But yeah, he's got, he's got some Marin. He's got, you know, we pick and choose, right? He brings so much to the show. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. And He's great. you were saying about red carpet, and I heard this recently, and I had never thought of it before. And that's like they say, the photographers on a red carpet, all you really need is one photographer there to take a bunch of shots yeah. and mail them around. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what's fascinating about a red carpet, uh, at least for me, is that that's where you see where you are in the entertainment industry. Like oh, Jennifer yes. Lawrence, very talented, very beautiful. They're excited. Even when you would get out and you would uh, get out of your car at Letterman, the photographer would kind of raise the camera like, Oh, yes. Well, I guess I'm here. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like in case his plane goes down, <laughs> you know, I want to. I... But other than that, it's it's really weird. I always feel like. Uh, I, well, I don't know how many times this has happened to me where there's a group of paparazzi in the street or at the airport and they'll take pictures of me and I'll go, all right, who are you really here for? Yeah. And it'll be like Jennifer Aniston. They yeah. heard is going to be showing oh, yeah. up there. Yeah, definitely. It's always, but that's kind of along the lines of the the character actor kind of thing. Yes. It's, you know, the entertainment industry, as liberal as everyone is, it's, it's like downright feudalism, right? There's kings and queens and, and you know, jesters, and, and we're like these strange jesters that entertain us. You see it at corporate events, entertain us. Yes. And then be gone. <laughs> you know? and, and I feel like when people take pictures of me at these red carpet things, it's just like it's almost like an insurance thing. Yeah. Like let's say I shoot somebody. Yeah. Later on the night they have a photo. Of me, <laughs> Absolutely. Photo. It's like we're here. It's you know it doesn't Something matter. Something could happen that yeah. gets them in the news. And you see how it's like contagious. Like so one person takes a picture. You see that when you're like in a restaurant and someone's like, "Hey, can I get a picture?" And, yeah. you know, people, you know, you're like, all right. And then people are like, well, maybe I should get a picture with that guy. Yeah. I don't know who he is. Maybe that's. Maybe I, that's... I've had it happen where someone is excited to see me and yeah. wants a picture. And then someone else goes over and goes, um, why did they want your picture? Who are you? <laughs> and then they want a picture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to. I used to have. Show, uh, after every show, I would meet. I would sign autographs and and meet everyone and um and it was great. It was great. But like there was so much like a 15-year-old shaking your hand. I don't know how old that kid is. I, I, <laughs> but you know, like there's certain there's certain experiences. So you, you know, like they're not impressed or they're impressed and they're very, you know, like when you're 12 and you have sweaty hands or they're 
they're just learning sarcasm. So they attempt to be sarcastic, but they're just highly insulting. Oh, like, yeah. you're fat. And oh, you're like, yes. hi, how yeah. are you? And then, but there's also like the guy that doesn't want to be there, but is there because of his wife or girlfriend. I don't want to come. She wanted to come. And oh. like, why would you even tell me that? And, and then there's a thing of like what I call good fan, bad fan. Like where uh, two people are there and one will say, you're great. Oh, my God. God, everything you do is great. And then their friend is there giving you a dirty look. Yeah, it's yeah, a strange. It's like... <laughs> and I think it's I think it's more of uh I don't know. I mean, I don't really know these people, but I I don't know if like if we're if you and I are sitting at a diner, people are like, Well, it's Gilbert and Jim, we can bother them. But I think with like Brad Pitt, they're like, Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. We don't want to interrupt Brad Pitt. He's so you still, beautiful. You still think no matter how successful yeah. the comic is, he's still from a lower class, a lower rung on the showbiz ladder. I think it's, I mean, I think it's, uh, yeah, I think there's also, you know, stand-up, there is no fourth walls. It's a conversation, whereas when we watch someone even in a play, you know, or, or Jennifer Aniston, she's she's untouchable. It's this thing... It's this. She was on that magic screen, whether it's big or small. But like a comedian, they were talking to me. So, I don't know. I'm a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> and also with comedy, it's like when comedians want respectability, they take a dramatic role. Yeah, it's very. I think it's interesting because there's. You know, comedians want that, right? We're, we're relatively yeah. serious people, right? I mean, we're cynical people. Yeah. But I always think it's, you see this all the time with like tele, television actors will get successful. I think it's, they want credibility, but there's also like the character guy that gets success and success makes that guy think that he's suddenly good looking. Oh, yeah. You see that. Where people are like, they're like posing, and you're like, dude, you, you're the dork. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with being the dork, but you're the dork. That's why. And they're like, no, I'm actually. But it is confusing when you get attention. I don't know if this has ever encountered. Uh, it's like I never got any attention from uh, women until like my early 30s. And initially I was like, oh, they're just being nice to me because I was on the yeah. you know, stage. They're being nice because I'm funny. And then around 35, I'm like, no, these women like me. They think I'm hot. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, I know that sounds delusional because it is delusional. But do you understand the, yeah, like, yeah. the, the miscommunication of affection? Like, you're like, well, if she thinks I'm funny, you know, I should probably be, you know, we should be naked right now. <laughs> I mean, I'm married and I have like a thousand kids, but I remember just thinking, and because that's parallel to the character re guy that gets successful, and it's like now I'm good looking, like that. Was, even the Hunchback in Notre Dame, like there was probably like, I don't know if that's based on a true story, but there was a moment where it's like, you know what, people are into this hump. Oh yeah, <laughs> right. Like this hump's pretty good. You know what I mean? It's like, I mean, humps on other guys, but you know the combination of the hump with my hair. <laughs> It works for me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Checks kick it. You enjoy every part of stand-up, Jimmy? You don't, you don't like the road anymore, do you? Because you got five kids and you miss them. Yeah, but, you know, it's also a great break. Yeah. You still romanticize that, too? I, I think the first night of out of town is amazing. It's like I'm sleeping in a nice bed, and uh, I know I'll be able to sleep in. There's not going to be, you know, a foot in my face or something like that. But the second day, I'm like, oh, what am I, what am I doing? You know, it's like I start hearing cats in the cradle, and I'm like, well, I, I, should, I should go back there, right? Just to maybe pick them up from school. Like, I don't, I don't know. Do you, do you go to school in the morning? Uh, not that much. No, I don't. You yeah. don't. Don't apologize for that. Dara, Dara, Dara does that. I, who does? Dara does that. Yes. Yeah, he doesn't do that. And you know, because we're nocturnal people. And we're horrible people. Yeah. No, but but like the morning thing, it's off the table. Here's the thing that's great about having five kids. I probably had to participate more when there were like three or four, but now there's five. I'm just like, you know, let's Oh, start. you throw them amongst let's, each well, other. Let's, let's hire some people. We got to get some help here. But and, the morning I don't do. But when you're out of town, 
you also have to be up at four in the morning to do, you know, Press Captain and Jim and Wacky Joe and <laughs> yeah. their morning zoo. Yeah. No, it's – there's something really especially awkward about some of those morning shows that that is – I mean, it's very humorous how you walk into a situation – and sometimes they just they they'll turn on you, like they'll be nice, but like one guy will turn on you, and it, it won't be super hostile, but they'll just be it's just like subtle. They'll be like, oh, this guy, oh yeah, and you're like, oh my gosh, they're turning on me, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, but it's a strange dynamic. You're a guest on their show, but it can be awkward. It and, can be very. And awkward. I always feel like. What makes me awkward usually, I'm okay with the radio. Yeah. But the early morning TV shows. That's very that's very hard, right? Cuz that's cuz they're all you know, cuz I think they have the role of newscaster and they're all dressed like Hillary Clinton. Yes. <laughs> so they're, they're attractive people. It's a they're 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 with a teleprompter. And some of them have not great interview skills. And they act like they know your comedy, but they have no idea. Right? And and I also feel like you could travel to Mars to and do an early morning T V interview and it will you wouldn't know the difference yeah. between any part of the But world. there's some exceptional ones. Some right? some are good, yeah. Like WGN Morning Show, that's fun. Yeah. But some of it I think they're kind of there, you know, I get, or maybe I'm just comfortable there. But you can do anything. But other ones, they're they're your, very serious. Your old sitcom was set in that world. Welcome to New York. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the was, one you did with Worldwide Pants. Yeah. So it was. Uh, yeah, we did. You know, it's weird because that was 15 years ago. You and Christine Baranski. I remember the show well. 15 years ago. It's crazy. Before that guy was born. <laughs> Oh, so here, let me tell you. Let me tell you this. This is crazy. I mean, this is nothing. But um, so I was doing this show, this this event, and the woman who was in charge of everything backstage was. Um, she goes, "I went to the same college as you," and I go, "Oh wow, that's weird." I go, "What year did you graduate?" Uh, no, she said, what year did you graduate? And I go, 88. And she goes, oh, that's the year I was born. Oh. <laughs> oh God. And I just remember going, oh, oh. oh. She was in charge of the whole thing. I mean, I, I knew she was in charge of the whole thing, but I didn't know that I was ancient. <laughs> I didn't know that I was a grandparent. Yeah, that that's but. something that always comes as a shock to you. It's like yeah. you're like, oh, I didn't know I was a hundred. We should point out who who Jim is referring to as our our yes. sound engineer's brother. And how old are you? 14. He's fourteen. 14. There you go. You were right. Fourteen. He you just were right. Got out of jail too. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, tell, let's talk a little bit about your background, Jim, because now sure. Gilbert said his father ran a hardware store. You're, yes. you're, you come from a family of bankers and, and conservative Midwest. Yes. And I loved I mean, your line about how the closest thing to show business where you came from was the marching band. Yes, definitely. I, uh, you know, and when I say conservative, I don't mean like Rick Santorum. Right. It you was, mean like button down. It was like, yes. It was, you know, after tons of generations – in the United States, my dad went to college and he got the white collar job. It was it was a huge thing, you know, like where there was no country club there, but they would have been country club people. And so um, pursuing something like the entertainment industry was it was strange. It was just why, you know, you're, I was raised to like get a job that I didn't like and work till I was 60 play golf for five years and die. And that would be a good life. And at these events you'd attend, what did they say about the Jews? <laughs> <laughs> the Jews. They're going right for it, huh, Gil? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, but that's, I mean, I don't look as airy and I do, as I do normally. Because right? my hair's Your hair's darker. I knew I was meeting a Jew. I was like, I'll dye my hair. <laughs> Maybe I'll mix in. <laughs> But it is weird. It is weird. It is. I mean, I think it's weird that there are 
country clubs that are Jewish country clubs. Don't you think that's a little insane? Oh, yes. I mean, but did you grow up? You grew up in a Jewish community, right? Uh, no, not Like you really. knew – there was an Italian guy who had a pizzeria. <laughs> no, but it was diverse? Uh, yeah, I remember – well, I grew up – in uh, the Crown Heights section, that was mainly like black and Puerto Rican. Where you, where you guys would yeah. beat up the black people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Jews were beating up yeah. the black people. Yeah, like like <laughs> way blocks up or the Hasidim. But no, yeah. I wasn't in that one. Are you from Coney Island proper or Crown Heights? Uh, I was born in Coney okay. Island. Okay. Wow. So like Alvy Singer. Oh, yeah. But not under the roller yeah. coaster. <laughs> wow. You said something interesting. So back to Jim's anti-Semitism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he doesn't stay with one thread very long. Um, what's that? No. Yeah. Tell, tell us about what they said about the Jews. No, there, you know what? <laughs> it was, I, you know, here's the great irony. <laughs> yes. Or the thing that I think yeah. is interesting is, look, I'm very white bread. I'm from Indiana, which is like, oh, my gosh, they don't even have, you know, they didn't have, like, the exotic restaurant where I grew up was an Italian restaurant. Yeah. Like, that was, it, it was like, you, should we go for international cuisine like Italian? Yes. It was that. But where I grew up is northwest Indiana, which is on Lake Michigan, which is Rust Belt. So there was a Jewish community. There was, there was, there was a huge Mexican-American population. And so, but because I'm so white bread and because I'm from Indiana, people are like, this guy's never met a Jew before. Uh, <laughs> They're like, like, I can't walk in. <laughs> when I started stand-up, that was like an ongoing thing with a tell. He would be like, at the Klan meeting, <laughs> do you guys do Pledge Allegiance? <laughs> But I think that, you know, even kind of like how we're joking around about that, I almost miss that aspect of of New York comedy where there were different kind of genres of comedians. Like there was an Italian Brooklyn comedian who was a good-looking Italian guy whose mother told him he should be a model, and he was kind of funny and dumb, and, and there was like a specific type. And there was just, like, different types of comedians. And I was kind of – the reason I had jokes about Indiana is, like, everyone had to have an ethnicity when I started stand-up. And so my ethnicity was white bread. And uh, – but it's – I kind of loved that era because it was – it was also, you know, we were all kind of of this different – but we were all weirdo comedians. But it was – it's weird. It's – obviously progress is better than this thing there. <laughs> but it's – it's strange that, you know, some of that, you know, family kind of culture stuff, it was like, so what did you do? Did your parents have sex through a sheet? You know, it's like it was just these broad cliches that were kind of fun, but it was something that has kind of disappeared, I think, from comedy. Well, comedy it, used to be more blue collar, I think, more working oh, yes. class. And now it's much more um, – you know, little Ivy League. Well, you don't you know? see Jewish, you know, classic Jewish comedians or Italian comedians right. anymore. The way you had Pat Cooper and the way you had right. Freddie Roman or, or uh, uh, Myron Cohen. Yeah, yeah. well, it's, it's a dying kind of like, thing. I always thought like Robert Klein and David Steinberg came at the same time, and they were like the, oh, the collegiate comedy. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. that broke that yeah. mold. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think it also <clears throat> it be, it got. I mean, this is where I'm kind of a nerd about this. There used to be more specific types. So in other words, Robert Klein was very observational, like similar to Seinfeld oh, yeah. was very observational. And you were eccentric and kind of offbeat. And now it's getting blurrier and blurrier, meaning country and, and R&B kind of combining. Where it used to be – like if you look at Chris Rock, he's very much a monologist. Yeah. But he's – you know, and an observational guy, but with a dose of social commentary. But now everyone is kind of a little bit everywhere. Like there's less of the classic clown comedian, like, you know, Mark Cohen, a clown. He was oh, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. He was a clown. Mark and Cohen, the, funny guy. And the preacher comedians. Like there would be like people that would be, you know, like Sam Kinison or, or Bill Hicks, like, or even Marin. Marin's kind of this railing against, and I think it's kind of blurring where. Um, you have to be a combination of a bunch. 
fewer gimmick comedians too, like where you had Professor Erwin Corey, or yeah. you, where, you, where or there was the a character. Coach. You know, there was yeah. the guy that was the coach. Bill was Kirkenbauer? The, yeah. yeah. And then there was the guy who the was the German guy, Franz, whatever he oh. played. I mean, talk about a stereotype that doesn't even necessarily exist, really. I mean, you know, like like the Germans having no sense of humor. It's like it might sound weird saying that now, but like 20 years ago, it was like, yeah, they have no sense of humor. Yeah. Also, it's it's funny. It's just like just recently I did a club in Peoria. Yeah. And that was always a joke name. Right. Hey, I Peoria. think oh, yeah, my agent got me booked in Peoria. Yeah. And uh, But you go to any of these places and you realize they all have the internet. Yeah. They all have cable. They yeah. all have everything. Yeah. And it's there's a whole generation. Like when I was starting off in stand-up, it was... I mean, I had watched comedians on The Tonight Show. There were some really resourceful comedians that would be like, you go to the, you go to the, you know, the um, Lincoln Center and they have tapes. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> but now these guys, I mean, there was, I remember witnessing when, you know, now nobody watches cable. Like, I'm sure these guys don't watch cable. Everything is on. But it if used they have to a be, TV. It used to be that cable. Comedy Central was on in every dorm room. And so you, you, there was just like a generation that was educated on different types of comedians. Because it used to be, I think, that how an audience would behave. Now they, they've watched people sit in an audience and not heckle. and But, but before, people would come in and they would be like, from their experience... They would, you're supposed to participate. Like, there was my wife's from Milwaukee, and her best friend growing up was. I remember when I went back, the first time I went back there, she's like, Oh, it's great to go to this comedy club because you love to heckle. And I was like, You know, you're not supposed to. And she's like, Well, a lot of comedians like it. So, I mean, we all know that there are those people that are like, I was helping you out there. But it used to be much more pervasive, right? And and I just, this. Brings another thing to mind. Uh, I always feel like audience-wise, movies and TV always get strip clubs wrong. Because in a strip club, in a movie or TV show, all the guys are, oh, yeah, baby, woo-hoo, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, take it. And no, that guys do not behave that right. way in strip right. clubs. I've never been to one, but yeah. <laughs> Trust I've me, heard. <laughs> I've been to. I've been on. I for both only. Of us. I've protested outside of stuff. <laughs> <That's> hilarious. <laughs> and, and you were talking about your show, uh, and you were saying how like you wanted to get things right, like you would look at the subway. Oh yeah. Oh, you wanted to get New York right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I think it's. I mean, you talk about strip clubs and. And there's just, I mean, being a New Yorker and seeing, you know, I, I did a movie where I played a cab driver. And it was like 10 years ago. And they're like, all right, you're the cab driver. I'm like, has anyone been in a oh, New York yeah. City cab? It's like, <laughs> they don't look like me. I mean, they're, you know, you can find any type of person driving a cab. But so, like, as a New Yorker, when you watch a TV show, like, even Friends, you're like, wait a minute. All right, so that's, that's the living room. Of their apartment. Yeah. It's well, just... We've t- Gilbert and I have talked about how every yeah. time you watch Seinfeld and they're walking through the streets, there's nothing but steam coming out of yeah. man- <laughs> manhole like covers. hiding how right. phone Because they're in Studio is. City. It looks like they're walking yeah. through right. hell. Right. Yeah. So you really and, wanted to get the, the, the New York, authentic New York, Smith yeah, and think, Walensky's I, and Katz's. And, I think, but I think that's also... And I learned this while I was doing it because I would have all these... We would, Jeannie and I would have all these meetings and we'd be like, no, we want it to be... Authentic and people would nod along because I think that's what everyone says. But even when when Adam and I are walking to Katz's, there was a director who was like, you know what? It's, it'll be more interesting if you walk the other way. And I'm like, but people that live on the Lower East Side or the East Village are going to know that's wrong, and that would take them out of it. So and it it's funny. It's like Hollywood was the last place to realize. 
that cab drivers no longer have like the little newsboy oh, yeah. cap and they're going, hey, those Yankees, huh? Yeah, yeah. they have a cigar. It's like you'd think it was like, uh, you know, it's like Hollywood's version of New York is very similar to like a 777 uh you know, like the the Carmel cab commercials, like oh, they're. Oh like, yes, <laughs> that's a weird. You watch, or like you know, like a local car dealership. You're like, wow, someone should have told the guy not to do it. Sometimes I'll see in a show that's supposed to take place in New York, and they'll they'll say something like, "Hey, you know, meet me on the corner of uh, Central Park and the Empire State Building." Yeah, like they'll know yeah. two kind of locations. Yeah. Well, you know, it's also on this show, we go to Katz's a lot. and There's a lot of pastrami on this show. Yeah, and you can't. I mean, I, I could, but you can't go to Katz's that much. I mean, you'd be dead. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, <laughs> but some of it is also, uh, you know, this is totally, uh, it, it's like capturing that New York place. Because sometimes, even Sex in the City, there are shows that shoot in New York. And you never, like, they go into some room and they're like here we're shooting at the f- fanciest restaurant here but you can't tell it's a fancy restaurant like sex in the city would do that oh yeah, Where, yeah. You would, you'd be like oh they're like here we are at this fancy restaurant that you can't tell it's in new york city so we wanted to and and cats is you can it's a big enough space where you can see what's going on and it can capture some of new york it almost feels like New York Eatery is a part of the, you know, the cast of the show. It's oh, the Selka, and there's, as I said, Smith and Walensky's, and yeah. it's really it's like a little bit of a travelogue. Yeah, and it's, but it's, I, I wish that, because I don't go out to dinner that often. Do you go out to dinner that often? No. I mean, there are people that, there, you know, I get emails. They're like, "Where should I go?" And I'm like, <laughs> "I have five kids. I don't know." I mean, I sneak away to Katz's, but. I also like the closest, most convenient. You know, I'm, I'd love the idea of a culinary adventure, but I'm like, I'm not going to go to like Greenpoint for and a burger. The other thing that gets me is in, in movies when a character gives directions and they go, okay, you take the A train and then you switch over to the IRT to get there. And I go, no, those trains wouldn't take you there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's... I mean, there was, uh, I was working on something, and uh, I don't want to out the guy, but we were in around Penn Station, and he was like, yeah, we should shoot here, capture some of Times Square. And I'm like, holy cow, this guy doesn't know. (laughs) (laughs) And you're like, Penn Station's pretty different from Times Square. Speaking of New York, is this true or bullshit, Jim, that you saw the uh, episodes of The Odd Couple when you were living in in, in, uh, in Indiana and you thought, well, New York looks sophisticated? Yes, definitely. Well, <laughs> sophisticated, but also um, gritty or something or energetic. Like, it was probably just exterior shots. Uh-huh. I haven't seen The Odd Couple Yeah, it forever. seemed like yeah. they probably shot the opening in an hour. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Well, you and can see the streets. You can tell if you look close. Oh, Oscar's yeah. looking in the strip club window, yeah. which is long gone. We should say uh, uh, take a moment to say Al Molinaro played Murray the Cop. Just oh, passed, yeah. passed away this week since yeah. we're talking about The Odd Couple. But And now that show's back on. What's the new one like? Oh, it's it, I think it might have come and gone friends. already. Oh, really? Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry. I watched about 15 minutes of it by accident, and I was going... What is this exactly? So we met. So Matthew Perry, he's the Oscar. He's the Oscar. Because yeah. when I think of Oscars, no, oh, yeah, <laughs> he's the first. I think of good-looking guys. Yeah, full oh. heads of hair, and that that look like they should be in Nantucket. And that's another thing that's weird with comedy. It's like there used to be this, you know, Nat Hiken, who uh, put on you know Car Fifty Four and. Phil Silvers with uh, uh, no, Bilko. Bilko. Yeah. yeah. And he liked funny looking people in comedy. And Friends is like they stepped off a magazine cover. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a friend that points out that even SNL, people on SNL don't look like comedians. Oh, yeah. That, that, that Weekend Update, those people look like 
newscast. Oh, Colin Jost. Yeah. 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 I mean, who's yeah. a nice guy yeah. and everything. Yeah. I'm not criticizing. But I think it's – I mean, I had a joke a long time ago how, um, you know, when you'd see Halle Berry in a movie – and she'd be like poverty stricken. The first thought is, why doesn't she become a model? I mean, uh, yeah. <laughs> she looks like Halle Berry. You know what I mean? Or like when you watch like a British drama, and you, you'll see like the female lead, and you're like, well, she's obviously going to get killed, right? I mean, she's. But there is something about the beauty. Like we love, uh, we love beautiful people. And hey, look, I love beautiful people too, but. It's I don't know. It seems kind of um, unnecessary, like realistic, like having, like even when we're trying to get extras on the show, I think the tendency is, you know, there's people from Connecticut that come in to do the extra thing. It's not the worst gig in the world, but they don't look like New Yorkers. I mean, New York looks different than it did 20 years ago anyway, but that's for sure. But we love America loves good looking people. And and I remember Halle Berry in Monsters Ball. Yes. Yeah. And I'm thinking she's the po black girl <laughs> yeah. uh, working in a luncheonette. I say get some pictures together. Yeah. She could model. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or Michelle Pfeiffer playing a poor waitress. Oh Frankie, my God! Yes. Yeah. That, that's you yeah. know, see that's and I heard yeah. I heard on yeah. stage. They had Kathy Bates. Kathy Bates. Right, that's right. Because there that's you right. could believe it, but then they had to get a good-looking person. Yeah, what is it, Marty? What was that? Oh, um, the oh, Borgnine? Borgnine? Yeah, Marty. Yeah. See, like, if they would do that today, they'd have Brad Pitt. Play oh, him. yes. <laughs> they'd well, like, it's just he's like, like, I can't I'm get a, a date. Fat, yeah. <laughs> I'm a fat, ugly man. <laughs> or, like, I remember, and I mean, you know, he's certainly a good actor and everything, but George Clooney in that movie, The... I, the Descendants or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the, the the one in Hawaii. Yeah, where his and wife I'm dies. thinking uh, how I can't. I can only feel so bad for him because I'm looking. I'm going. He's George Clooney. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, no matter what his problems are, this guy could get laid in a second. <laughs> well, I also, I also have. I think it's strange that um, newscasters are good looking. I mean, there's no reason. That we need to hear about Al Qaeda from someone wearing lip gloss. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's like, why? There's a hurricane in Houston. Why are you wearing an evening gown? <laughs> it's weird. Well, I mean, Funny. I find they have hotter looking girls as anchor women than you could find on like the Playboy channel or stuff. Yeah. I mean, totally hot looking. Especially on Fox News. Oh, oh, yeah. Where they're yeah. all blonde and yeah. blue eyed goddesses. Well, they're doing that on ESPN too. Yeah. There's like really attractive women. I only see them as a daughter or a mother. <laughs> <laughs> Dara was saying what a gentleman you were before I'm you got here. I'm always a gentleman. She said he is such a class act. Also, Dara, the, my wife there, just yeah. said. Uh, she was looking up information on you. Yeah. And she goes... <laughs> <laughs> she says, very seriously and shocked, she goes, do you know Jim Gaffigan is from India? <laughs> <laughs> India? Oh, yeah, poor Dara. Was Indiana. I thought there must have been a section of India where people are very light skinned. Special skin. Sikhs, light skinned Sikhs. <laughs> <laughs> Pale Sikhs. Do we have the chronology of this right? But before you, you even thought about pursuing stand-up, you went into advertising. I so did. I, well, I studied finance in college because I did what I was supposed to. And then I hated that. And a friend from college helped me get a job in advertising. And even going into advertising, everyone in my family was like, oh, that's crazy. Well, it's, a crea it's still a creative yeah. field, right? And um, I did that, and but I started stand up while I was doing that. And, um, we found it interesting that you wrote commercials. So I was telling yeah. Gilbert you wrote commercials for Hardee's. Oh. Yeah. But yeah. before we get off the advertising, this gets me to another thing. Yeah. Okay. About movies and TV, I would like to see a list of how many movie and television characters have worked in advertising <laughs> as the job that they go right, to. Right. Yeah. 
Right. A well, lot. And then that's I think that's why we're we are so surprised how good Mad Men is. It's like they talk about advertising, but it's interesting how they use right. it. Right. That's right. Cuz we're used to like, you know, I work in advertising, let's go out to dinner. Oh, you know, yes. Like there's no right. practical use of it for the story. It it's like it's usually if you have a 9 to 5 job, in movies and television, you're an advertising. Well, especially in the '60s, and in, in movies, all the Jack oh. Lemmon movies. Oh, uh, he was always an Good ad neighbor man. Sam. Right, he was always an ad yeah. man, or Darren on Bewitched. Oh, that yes, was, yeah. that was a cool job. Yeah, ad man. That was a very cool job because when I started in it, there was a book by um, David Ogilvy. Um, I don't know what. Maybe it was called Mad Men. I don't know, but it talked about. It was a very you know, it was a creatively <clears throat> fulfilling, it was a business job. It was before they had, people went and got an MBA so you could go in and tell a company what to do. It was really an interesting job that just essentially people going and getting their MBA made it. You worked for Ogilvy and Mather? Which I is did. A, 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 I worked for Gray, too. And Gray Advertising. Gray, I was like the token goy. <laughs> My dad was in advertising, so I know these companies. J. Walter Thompson was around then. and I have a, When I worked at Gray, I first worked at Gray, and um, I was kind of the token goy. And, <laughs> and at one point, they're like, I worked uh, as an account guy on Downey. And they're like, all right, you know what? I was sitting in the thing. They're like, all right, hey. And they were, they were like, uh, all right, go and uh, get a schlep bag for the, the things. And I'm like, okay. So I call up, and I go, I need a schlep bag. And they're like, <laughs> And then I went back and I go, I don't know what a schlep bag is. And they're, like, oh. <laughs> they're like, the biggest goy in the world. <laughs> and how did you, I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. by the commercials you wrote, but in the interest yeah. of time, how did you make the transition from writing these commercials to, was stand-up a dare? Do I have that right? Stand-up was a dare, but it was very much, um, I think it was something I always wanted to do. And I had a big fear of public speaking, so I took this improv class. But I also was very interested in improv. And then um, it was a dare, but I was looking for someone to dare me. That's to interesting. Do it. It's like something I remember when I was the night before I graduated college, I told a friend of mine, I was like, you know, I just want to be a comedian and an actor. And she was like, you should do that. And I'm like, but everyone wants to be a comedian and actor. And she's like, no, I don't. And I'm like, all right, well, you don't, but everyone else does. Like, I thought, I assume everyone would want to do this. And so um, I had always wanted to do it, but I didn't know anyone. And so, but I did like a stand-up seminar kind of thing because essentially someone held my hand. Not They didn't do that, but I performed in front of a friendly audience. And um, But I was doing advertising at that point, and uh, because I kept my I kept my day job for a long time, and um, but I had no expectation. Like I, you know, I think I'd done stand up a year, and I was like, "Well, uh, I'm ready, I'm ready for the piles of money." But it was a, it was a long journey to Letterman, and it was yeah, and everyone in my kind of generation or group had uh, gotten Letterman or Conan, mm -hmm. and um, I would go on stage and the bookers would kind of be frightened to make eye contact because I was the one that they were not interested in. So they'd be like, hi. So um, it was, you know, I came to kind of this this moment of peace where I was like, well, you know, I'm, I get to do what I like because I was very angry. You know, my friends were being wildly successful. And so um, I, uh, you know, I got to the point where I had to sit there and go, all right, well, at least I get, I'm going to be the weird uncle who lives in New York City, who does stand up, which, uh, you know, I had no credits because if you did stand up, people like, have you been on Letterman? No. Have you been on Conan? No. And they're like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> You're a lunatic. <laughs> right. And and it's so funny when you start doing stand up, all the people who'll say to you stuff like, you know what you should do? The Carson show. Yeah. <laughs> Have you thought of doing that? Yeah. You know what? I never thought of that. Yeah. Does Jim know you started at the tender age of fifteen? Oh yeah. Do you know that about him? I think I remember reading about yeah. you when I was you know, there's a thick book about comedians, so I read all about it. I know all about it. <laughs> now it's on the internet. It used to be you had to get a book. You had to go to the uh, 
Samuel French bookstore because they, were, they wouldn't even have books on comedy in regular bookstores. So, but yeah, I did some research. The stories, the stories behind the stories. You want to talk a little bit about your work as an actor? Sure. You've done a, a lot of stuff, and you did terrific work in a movie called The Great New Wonderful. Oh, when I was watching it today, you and Tony Shalhoub, very, oh, very funny together. And Gilbert hates auditioning, and I was oh, curious. Yeah. I was curious about how you feel about it. Yeah. No, I remember. Uh, it's really, for me, I don't have a great memory, so. Um, the auditioning process is is painful, and I think it's I think it's more painful for comedians because we're not used to waiting, so we have to sit there and wait. We have to take material that is usually we don't get or we don't like, and then we have to go in there and be kind of passive in this thing and i've walked i'm sure you've walked into rooms after you've spent hours preparing and they look at you and they're like no yeah and you're like if you could have looked at a headshot save me the trouble yeah yeah and so but i i remember it's it's like i described it as stripping except for you don't get a dollar because it's you know it's this strange and it's just like the the you know the dynamic of People are friends with the casting director. You have to act like you're friends with the casting director. You go in there. Sometimes you you, you try and be funny, and then sometimes there are the people in the room are exhausted and tired, and it's weird doing the show, seeing it on the other side. My wife is just like, I can't believe I did this for years. You, you, you know what? What's weird is that. The times that I've been on the other side of the auditioning process, yeah. you do see it in a totally different way. You have yeah. compassion. Yeah. Yeah. And you go, uh, you, you know, and, and I'm like the worst person to talk about this. And that's when you see people who come in and audition and you go, oh, you know, they say, hi, oh, I'll be reading for the part of Doug or whatever. Yeah. And you go, oh, I kind of like this guy. And then when they start acting, they're <laughs> acting. And it's like all of a sudden they lose whatever yeah. was charming about them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really weird thing because it's, it's never uh, uh, the dynamic that you're in. And I also feel like I always felt like people that were really good at auditioning were people that had the advantage of a photographic memory. So in other words, they were good at memorizing things, which is different from the task of acting. So during pilot season, you'd sit there and, and, and it would be somebody that had a photographic memory would be better in the audition, but not necessarily right for the role. Mm -hmm. And I also think that it's such a crapshoot. It's such a crapshoot. And your agent tells you, oh, these people are really keen on seeing you. Oh, yes. And you go in there, and, and they're like, thank you so much for coming in. And then you walk in the room, and they're like, who's this? Yeah. You're like, remember you wanted to see me? And they're like, okay. And you're like, well, what the? Well, tell Jim about Dick Tracy. The what? Tell Jim about Dick Tracy. Oh. <laughs> so uh, it relates they, to that. They had me come in and audition for the part of Mumbles. And they said, when we were writing this part, all we could think about is Gilbert Gottfried. <laughs> You're the only person. Yeah. We we don't want to even want to look. We're not having a... If you do this, if you don't do it, the part's not even in the movie. And so then I was assured I yeah. had that. And then they go, oh, uh, they're not going with you. And I said, oh, okay, who are they going with? And they go, Dustin Hoffman. <laughs> and I'm thinking, so at what point... Were me and Dustin Hoffman going uh, nose to nose oh, on that. this? <laughs> I've lost. I think it's because being a character actor is it's very similar to uh, you know it's like Code for Ugly, right? Oh yeah. And so it's like I also have auditioned for parts. They like me, and then I'll say, "Who got it?" And they're like, "Cedric the Entertainer." And I'm like, "So they switched." They com went a completely different way. Like, uh, like Cedric the Entertainer. Yeah, yeah. No, like they'll just switch completely, and you're like, why did I even have to audition? Oh, you're yeah. Obviously. And then sometimes you audition for things 
just because the offer they have out is not set. So you're like, you're auditioning for something, but they're like, you know, if we can get Liev Schreiber, we're going to give it to him. But we got to see if he's taking a vacation. Oh, week. yeah. You know, so it's brutal. It's humiliating. One but time I, years ago, my agent sent me up for this part, and she goes, now play it straight when you go in there. Play. And, and I went there, and they were look staring at me when I came in. Yeah. And, uh, and they said, you know this part is for an 80-year-old judge, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> play it real straight. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's just insane. It's insane. They just want to see you. Like I, 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 I still at this point find it hard to say no to auditions. Like I'll be like, I don't know if I'm right for this, and they're like, Well, why don't you just go in and waste a day? Why don't you just waste yeah, two days yes. of your life? And you're like, well, well, I don't want to. It's like this is for somebody that I'm not this type. And they're like, just go in. Just waste your time. Oh, yes. And then you go in and then they're like, you know what? They don't know if you're the right type. I knew I wasn't the right type, but (laughs) I can't say no. One time my agent sent me for like a jeans commercial. (laughs) Oh, I think of you for that. Yeah. (laughs) You and and Brooke Shields. And I said to my agent, I said, well, all the guys and girls in jeans commercials are like models. Yeah. They're beautiful models. And and he goes, no, no, they're really trying to go for more character, funny, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I showed up and getting back to the hunchback of Notre yeah. Dame, <laughs> I felt like Quasimodo in that oh, yeah. room. The guys and girls are like, Gorgeous, yeah, and and it's like me. It's like uh, I, I felt like a circus freak. I want to live in a world where it's Gilbert Gottfried yes. for George Ashton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You, you got to go to another podcast, Jim, and we're we're probably running oh, short. Oh, what on we time. should Frank and I are always interested. Yeah. In yeah. character actors, old yeah. character actors you've worked with. Oh. Well, you worked with the great Brian Cox on stage. Cox, I saw you yeah, in that championship amazing. season. He was, I mean, that's, and it's interesting, his story. He was this guy who. He's from Scotland, which yeah, Gilbert knew. I didn't know. Who did, who did, I mean, he would tell a story. He was like, yeah, I traveled around doing lights for three years, just watching this, these people act. And that's, I mean, it's really humble, some of the experience they do in the UK. Like, they don't do any acting for like 10 years before I got to carry one spear on stage. <laughs> and I'm like, I wouldn't do that. But I'm trying to think of like great character actors, because I do love the great character actors. But um, Mistaken for Philip Seymour Hoffman, but never oh, worked yeah. with him. Yeah. No, no, I did. Oh, did I you? improvised uh, a movie for Bob Balaban that never... It was right before no Philip Seymour Hoffman got huge. And I think my role on that championship season was offered to Phil Hoffman. There was a lot of, and great and wonderful, that role was offered to Philip Seymour Hoffman. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, to this day, people are always kind of like, oh, my gosh, you look, have you ever been told you look like Philip Seymour Hoffman? You look like a dead actor. Or or this (laughs) other fat white guy. (laughs) Have you ever been told you look like a fat white guy? That's what my Twitter feed is. Or, like, if there's a football pe- player, people will be like, this is like a thin, like if Jim Gaffigan was thin and good looking, this is what he looked like. <laughs> they send me photos all the time. Well, you know, this show, you know, we, we dive deep. We talk about obscure yes. old show business. Yeah. So, you, you, Eartha Kitt was, I was doing yes. some research on, she was on Welcome to yes. New York. Did you work with her? I did. Yeah. And she was she was pretty amazing. She was really. Really Forgive funny. the siren. But, you know, I mean, by the way, it's like, I mean, I guess Cloris Leachman's, but, like, Cloris Leachman is a genius. I oh, mean, you've both worked with her. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. think she's, like, like wow. Like, it was, when we were on the Ellen show, she was so funny. I think Ellen was threatened at times. Oh, how yeah. how talented Cloris Leachman was. And Cloris is crazy. Oh, so, yeah. So, um, but, like, I would say savant funny. Like, it's just in her bones. Like, she could just walk across a room and get two laughs. 
And she played straight roles early in her career. You see her on yeah. the Twilight she was, Zone. Oh, yeah. She was almost uh, Miss America. She yeah. was yeah. Uh, Miss yeah. Chicago. And for, she she was in that role in the Last Picture Last show. Picture Show. Yeah. Right. Like before, a yeah. tragic yeah. part. Before she did big com- broad yeah. comedy. Yeah. But I'm trying to think of other... I'm sure there's tons that I'm. You work with Jason Patrick, who's Jackie Gleason's uh, yes. grandson. Do I have that right? Yeah, I yep. always I know there's a relation, but I don't. Yeah, know. yeah. And his father is the writer of uh, that championship season, who was the priest. In oh, the Exorcist. that's right. That's right. Miller. Yeah, Jason. Jason Miller. Miller. Right. Yeah. And then um, I wish I could remember any of this stuff. I'm trying to think of who else I've. I can't remember anything. <laughs> Let's call us up and, and, and we'll let it up. in. <laughs> it's probably someone legendary. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot I worked with Jesus. Uh, <laughs> we, also, we also asked, I guess, if there was anything that they grew up watching that was kind of, that was, that was motivational, something that was really inspired. Gee, maybe I can do this with my life. Oh, you know, I've said this before. I think I saw uh, Phyllis Diller. On, I think, the Mike Douglas show. And I was like, this is amazing. Really? First I comic think. you saw on television? No, it probably wasn't the first, uh-huh. but like it was Phyllis Diller and um, um, now I can't remember the name. <laughs> um, he's from Ohio. He's from Columbus, Ohio. Jonathan. Jonathan Winters? Jonathan Winters. And, but, you know, Letterman was a huge thing, being from Indiana. Sure. And seeing him on TV and seeing Mellencamp on TV. Kind of this notion of they got out was a big thing. But, um, yeah, no. But I remember I saw this. I can't remember the name of the movie, but my mom took my brother and I to this movie. must have been a matinee. And it was a drama. And uh, But we were at the Chicken Unlimited. And my mom said, what do you guys want to be when you grow up? And my brother said, a helicopter pilot. And I said, I wanted to be an actress. <laughs> and I did. I was like, I want to be an actress. There was, that's, you know, and I was, the sad thing, I was 18 at the time. No, I was, I don't know what I was, maybe eight or nine, but um, didn't seem like a practical thing. You know? No. And again, they didn't, they didn't encourage you. No, uh, and, they you know yeah. they thought it was this neat thing that Jimmy was doing. Oh yeah, Jimmy's doing stand up. <laughs> like when my dad, my mom passed away, my dad got remarried, and the woman was very nice, and she was like, maybe at the wedding you could do some stand up. Oh yeah, and I'm like, I'm never coming back here. <laughs> I never asked you this, Gil. What was your family's reaction? Uh I see. That's the thing. I can only imagine what was going on in their heads because that was like especially and I realize with myself when I get as I get older I look at things more realistically absolutely and so to say I'm gonna make it in show business it's like saying I'll go to a 7-Eleven, buy a lottery ticket and win a billion dollars and live off that especially you know like, you also have been at this, we've been at this long enough, like, I think there's one thing to be a comedian, but there's another thing to, like, actor? Actor? Are you out of your mind? Oh, yeah. Are, are you, like, because I've always done the acting and stand-up, and it's, yeah. but if I was solely an actor, I would have gone crazy. Oh, like, yes. Or actress? Like the way we just dispose of women in this culture, yeah. oh. it is insane. It's like, oh, you're 26, throw her away. Yeah, you know, well, the stand-up can always do something. You, you can know, always. It's like go. for every Jennifer Aniston, there's like hundreds of very successful actresses that people are like, yeah, not anymore. No. Yeah, no. it's like sometimes a movie comes up on TV and you go. Oh, she used to be in everything back yes. then. Yes. We talk about it all the time on the show. We've talked about Penelope Ann Miller. And, oh, yes. And, and what happened to the, and Bridget Fonda and what happened to all these actresses that she used to see everywhere. That yeah, and vanished. they probably, some of them remove themselves, I suppose, but it's, and you know, then you see like you watch HBO shows and I mean, I don't know. I don't want to get into this, but like they're also like taking off their clothes and they're dry humping a guy and you're sitting there i just my joke is like dad i got an acting role <laughs> and 
<laughs> it's fine if they're fine with it, but it's also that you know it's you know it's not like that. It's kind of like being in Stuff Magazine. It's fine. I think it's great. I'm a fan of naked women, but don't think that that's you know that might help two out of the thousand women, but the rest of them are just in a thong in yeah. a magazine. There, there's another girl willing yeah. to show her tits. Yeah. Uh, you know. So, aren't you glad you didn't become an actress? I'm, I'm glad <laughs> I didn't. <become> an <laughs> I'm glad I didn't. But you know, we're both fans of naked women. I so. think I think I'm 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 a fan. I have I have. We've invited I'm, Mr. Skin on the show. Do you there know who you go. he is, Mr. Skin? I think I was interviewed for a Skin website. There you go. A million years. <laughs> He's coming on. There you go. Okay. Well, this has been Gilbert. God- Hi. <laughs> Alan's Wybell is here, by I'm the way. Gilbert <laughs> Gottfried. <laughs> yes. just, Alan's Wybell came in. I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast with my co host, Frank Santo Padre, here at the legendary Friars Club in New York City. And we've been talking to Jim Gaffigan, and please catch his new HBO special. Gotta get that pussy. I do. do. Thank you. Gotta gotta get that. Uh, We didn't even talk about you you performing for the Pope. Yeah, that's... I mean, there's a funny story about that. I mean, that you would love. Maybe I'll tell you. All right, so... First of all, let me set this up. All right? I'm from the Midwest. All right? I'm from the Midwest. I love the Northeast. I love the Northeast. But, you know... D.C., really Baltimore to Boston, the Acela line, I refer to it as the corridor of hate. And that is because there is an anger, an anger that is deep-seated, you know, in Boston and Philadelphia and Jersey. That is why the Revolutionary War started. I know it sounds like it's a bit. It's just a story I've told before. Because, you know, like those, those guys in Virginia like Patrick Henry was like, give me liberty or give me death. It was like, but like it was the, the Boston guys coming down going, yeah, we just started a war with England. And those Virginians were like, well, well, I was just talking. I didn't, <laughs> yeah. I didn't mean. <laughs> and so anyway, so there is an anger there. Like, you know, it's a combat, which goes back to, you know, if you can make it in here in New York, you can make it anywhere. But that applies to all the Northeast. So I'm in Philadelphia. I'm opening for the Pope. But I'm not opening for the Pope. I'm <laughs> opening for the Pope Mobile. You know, like I do stand up, Sister Sledge comes on, the Pope Mobile drives around. And so, <laughs> and, and I'm on the Ben Franklin Parkway, right? And what they've constructed is this st- outdoor stadium. They, they created this stadium. And then there's people on the parkway, there's people on the highway waiting to see the Pope. There's screens all around Philadelphia. But in this area that I'm in, um, it's relatively empty because later on the Pope's going to speak and um, Aretha Franklin's going to sing and Bocelli and all these things. So I'm kind of like on – I'm on like the the afternoon Republican debate. You know what I mean? So I'm before that. So it's essentially an empty area and I'm doing stand-up. So I go up on stage and I'm doing some jokes about Philly and all this stuff and – I said, you know, Philly, like one of the jokes I said was like, look, uh, being very self-aware, I'm like, I know that after my set, you're going to want to leave, stick around. There's this guy coming up that's amazing. (laughs) He's 78. He used to be a bouncer in a dance club. Stick around. And the other joke uh, I did specifically was I go, Philly loves the Pope. Philly loves the Pope. Not that I was worried, but you guys weren't that nice to Santa Claus. Now, do you know about the Santa Claus <laughs> It was Claus an Eagles thing? game, wasn't it? It was an Eagles yeah, game yeah. 100 years yeah. ago. It was like 20,000 people in the stadium. But here's where I forgot that it's the Northeast. Where I forgot that it's the Northeast is that these people don't like it when people bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> they don't like it when they bring that up. So, again, I'm essentially performing for an empty stadium, but there's people on the streets. And so in the corner of my ear, I, my ear, I start hearing, boo. Oh, boo. <laughs> so there's only like 20 people doing it, but they're booing the guy before their spiritual leader comes on. Like, I just love that. That's like only 
in Philadelphia, would they sit there and go, yeah, you know, we're going to hear this guy talk about forgiveness and all this stuff, but this guy, boo. It was just, I just loved that whole experience. I was like, I wasn't even thrown because I was, it was empty. And it's like, it's a no win situation. But like, they, I got booed. <laughs> I got booed. And it was not even that great of a joke. And then my Twitter feed, people were like, look, bringing that up in Philadelphia is like bringing up the Holocaust in Germany. And I'm like, <laughs> not quite. <laughs> I'm like, first of all, the Holocaust happened. And second of all, Santa Claus is not real. <laughs> but I loved it. I loved it. And it was, and by the way, it's like, if I knew that information now, I wouldn't have done the joke. Because, you know, I, that's, you know, I'm not sitting there trying to, you know, hit the hornet's nest. That's not my style of comedy anyway. <laughs> but they were, they're about to see the Pope. <laughs> and if they could have tackled me, they would have. <laughs> they're like, we should beat this guy. But that's the Northeast, right? That's Jersey. That's Boston. That's, you did, know. Did you ever meet the Pope? I did meet the Pope. Wow. I did meet the Pope. And he had no idea who I was. <laughs> of course he had no idea. And there was a guy, there was an Italian guy or a Spanish guy. I think a Spanish guy standing by him going, uh, Comedica, the comedia, the famoso comedica, uh, Jim Gaffigan. And the Pope's like, yeah, I don't give a care. <laughs> I don't care. But I got my mother-in-law, who's very a very devout Catholic. She met the Pope. And I was like, I win. I right. win. I'm the best son-in-law ever. Hands down. She met the Pope. So the now I have story. to do, this will be sign off again? our twice ending show. <laughs> I'm Gilbert Gottfried. This has been Gilbert Gottfried's amazing colossal podcast with my co-host Frank Santo Padre. And we're still at the legendary Friars Club in New York City. We're here with Jim Gaffigan. Uh, please catch his Cinemax special. Loves me a hairy pussy. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> it's got subtitles. All right. Thanks, you guys. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Jim.